and encouraged us over the last 50 years. Without your support and encouragement, as you will see as we get into the program, uh, we couldn't do the things that we have done and the things that we need to do. So thank you for not only for being here, but thank you for your support and encouragement. I'd like to start off this evening the same way that we start our Lions Club meetings. That is, with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Lion Timer Down, would you please come up and join us and pledge allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Format for this evening will be as follows. Um, I will talk. I will talk to you about the International Association of Lions Clubs. This is the organization that forms the framework and the rules of operation that our club uses in order to do what we need to do. So I'm going to talk about Lions International and the foundation that they give us, under which we function. Lion Gate Guy Yale will follow me, and Lion Gale, like Guy Yale will speak about the first 50 years of the Bethany Lions Club. Uh, Lion Guy will be followed by Lion Arnie Carey, who will talk to, talk to us about our horse show, probably the, the highest profile project that we do, and our biggest fundraiser over the years. So. If I call your attention to the screen, if you'll see up on the screen right now, uh, you'll see our emblem. That emblem you see along the roadsides in almost every town in Connecticut. In fact, you see that emblem along the roadsides as you enter the towns and cities of every town in the entire United States. In fact, if you've done any international traveling, you see this emblem displayed proudly on the bar as you enter towns and cities all over the world. Twenty-eight million dollars. I mean, I said it wrong. Two hundred and eighty million dollars. That's how much the Lions here in the United States raised last year and we use it to fill humanitarian needs in our home communities and all over the world. Fifteen million volunteer service hours. We don't just raise money, we don't just spend money, we also give of our time to serve our communities and to serve the world. Now, that's what we do. I'd like to spend a few moments telling you why we do this and how we do this. We do this as part of the International Association of Lions Club, headquartered out in Oak Brook, Illinois. We were founded in 1917 by a gentleman named Melvin Jones. He was a businessman, and he lived out in the Chicago area. He found us as a service organization for men. And I'd like to point out right now, it says up there, a service organization. Many other organizations for men, actually, there were several of them founded right about the same time Lions Club was founded. Most of them are fraternal organizations. And the big difference between a fraternal organization and a service organization is that our reason for existence is to serve. That's why we exist. And if we don't do that, then we're not clients. Because that's what Melvin Jones set us up to be. An organization of, of men who serve. You might ask the question of how Melvin Jones decided to do this. 
And the, answer, and the answer to that actually is, is kind of interesting. Um, I could ask you right now, what was going on in the world in 1917? You're darn right, World War I. Started in 1914, ended in 1918. So, Lions Club was founded right smack in the middle of World War I. And that's not an accident. Melvin Jones was disgusted by the hatred, intolerance, and suffering that the world was going through because of World War I. And he wanted to do something about that. Also, I don't know whether you realize it or not, but back in 1917, there were very few, if any, government social programs to help people in need. There were almost no government social programs. And Melvin Jones liked the quote of statement made by a prominent businessman of his day. And let me read you that statement. There are poor and needy people in this world who are the way they are by their own shortcomings. But there are many, many poor and needy who are that way because of the shortcomings of someone else. And there are countless people, people of means, who could help but they are not caring enough to do anything about it. Those are the three great motivating factors that caused Melvin Jones to decide he wanted to set up a service organization and right from the word go, in fact, less than one year after he started Lions International, he had, he had an international convention there still weren't any clubs outside the United States yet, but that didn't bother him. He knew, he just knew, that there were, there were very soon going to be many, many clubs all over the world. And within two years, the first internet, the first club outside the United States was found out in Canada. Um, if I go on, if you ask the question of, of what's an organization all about, the best way to get an answer to what an organization is all about is to look at their mission statement. And on the screen now is the mission statement of Lions International. To create and thought, well, before I read this, I want you to watch for the next couple slides. Watch for the influence of World War I, a lack of government social programs, and the lack of a social consciousness among people who had the means to help other people, but not be caring to do so. You'll see it embodied in some of the things that are here, the way Melvin Jones set them up. Mission statement was to create and foster a spirit of understanding among all people for humanitarian needs by providing voluntary services through community involvement and international cooperation. You'll see right from the word go, Melvin Jones said, you must affect your own community. Every Lions Club has the charge to do this. You must be active in your own community, and you must be active in the world. So he, he was not a man of uh, meager ambitions, and he has directed our clubs that our vision must extend all the way from our own community to the, the, the world community. Our motto, as you might guess, is we serve. The slogan of Lions International is liberty, intelligence, our nation's safe, and our nation's safety. And you know, I didn't notice this until the other night, and I'm sure I should have known this a long time ago. Look at what the first letters of liberty, intelligence, the first letter of each word spells. That can't be an accident, can it? No, I don't think so. Liberty, intelligence, and our nation's safety. I have another document that I want to show you. This is actually part of the Constitution. Uh, the, the motto and the slogan are there. 
There's another document that's part of the Constitution that's a little bit wordy, and I'm not going to read all the way through it, but I want to point out some words in it. This thing called Lion's Objects is part of our Constitution. By objects, they mean goals, the goals that the clubs are to go after. Uh, just quickly, uh, you probably you would have a hard time reading that, but let me just quickly run through this. The first object talks about understanding, to, to foster understanding among the people of the world. The second one talks about promoting good government and good citizenship. The third one talks about civic, cultural, social, and moral welfare of our own communities. The next one talks about friendship, good fellowship, and mutual understanding. The next one says, our clubs are to be a forum for open discussions. The last one talks about to encourage service-minded men to serve their community without personal reward. I'm going to show you now just a couple of the bylaws from, of our Constitution. Um, you, can, you can read those while I'm talking. I've I got to tell you a little bit of a story. When I first joined the Lions Club, it was uh, uh, not too long after I joined. Uh, and I guess when you're a new lion, you're a cub. So I was still a cub. But I was at one of our meetings. And at that meeting, someone put up their hand and said, you know, there's elections going on. And, and there are some things, we, we, we need to get involved here. We need to endorse certain candidate. Immediately, someone in the group put up their hand and said, Mr. President, point of order, we are not to discuss any politics at our meetings. And like that, we were off to the next subject. Nobody objected, nobody did anything. We just off to another subject. And I said to myself, I think I'm missing something here. Because I had never read the bylaws the by in our Constitution. And so I went and I looked them up, and this is what I found. Bylaw number one says, You shall not endorse or recommend any candidate for public office, nor shall partisan politics or sectarian religion be debated by members during meetings of the club. And the second one goes on to say, except the further his or her progress in lionism, no officer or member of the club shall use his or her membership as a means of furthering any personal, political, or, uh, or other aspiration, nor shall the club as a whole take part in any movement, not keeping up, not in keeping with the purposes and objects of the Lions Club. So, two bylaws that basically say, you've got to stay focused on what this is all about. If you look at the things that are up there, you'll see those are things that distract us from our real objectives. And, and now I've got to show you one more bylaw, and I always get a little chuckle out of this one, except I don't know too many people who read a constitution and get a chuckle out of reading it. <laughs> but there is another bylaw that always makes me smile, because as most of you have got to know, in, in any organization that's got a formal constitution and bylaws, a parliamentary procedure defines a procedure that organization can change its constitution or bylaws anytime they want to. There's always, if you want to do something like that, there's always some very strict things that you must follow. Uh, you can't just get a couple of people together and, uh, and do a vote and change that. You've got to do, anyway, there's, there's a long procedure involved, but you can change anything you want to. And take a look at bylaw number six. I'll put it in plain English for you. Bylaw number six says, I don't care whether you've got a quorum or not, whether you have a unanimous vote of the club or not, you don't change or suspend even temporarily bylaws one and two. Now, whoever wrote this thought that bylaws one and two were very, very important. And you know, I've learned through my years in the Lions Club that they are very important. Because those bylaws tell us to keep our nose out of other things, to keep focused on the business that we are at, and they eliminate things that distract us or divide us. 
they keep, they tell us, keep with what you're trying, you're, you're, you're here for. Now, a little bit of statistics. As of last October, when I started getting my statistics for this talk, Lions International had about almost a million and a half members. That makes us, by the way, without any doubt, and by far, the largest service organization in the world. We have over 44,000 clubs worldwide. We're broken up into 738 districts. We exist in 186 countries. And, and I want to show you another document that looks something like the Lions Code of Lions of Objects, but this one's called the Lions Code of Ethics. This is not part of our Constitution. However, many, many lions consider this document to be the definition of the essence of lionism. It's a little code of ethics. Again, I'm not going to read everything that's up there, but let me just throw some words at you. The first one up there talks about that I'm going to live my life in such a way that I merit a reputation for quality of service. I will, if I, I'm not going to accept any profit or success that I have bought at the, at the price of the loss of my own self-respect. I'm not going to take any undue advantage over someone else. The next one says, remember that in building up my own business, it's not necessary to tear down somebody else's. Whenever any doubt arises as to the right or ethical correctness of what I'm doing, it says, resolve this with your own conscience before you proceed. Here's an interesting one. It says, you must hold friendship as an end, not as a means. Now, what does that mean? Stop and think about it. What does it mean? Friendship is an end, not a means. It means you don't become friends with somebody else in order for advantage, for your own advantage, because you want something. You want to be a friend with somebody else, you be a friend to be a friend, period. And not to take advantage or to get further yourself. Uh, I like this one, it says, always bear in mind my obligations to a, as a citizen of my nation, my state, and my community, and to give to them unswerving loyalty and word, act, and deed, to give of them freely of my time, my labor, and my means, to aid my fellow men by giving my sympathy to those who are in distress, my aid to those who are weak, and my substance to those who are needy. And the last one is really nice. To be careful with my criticism and liberal with my praise. To build up, not to destroy. Now, this is not part of our Constitution, but this is held very sacred by every line. And we demand this of our members. In fact, in every induction ceremony when we bring a new member into the club, we explicitly ask that new member, are you ready and prepared to be a member of this club to follow the Lions Code of Ethics. And the person must say, yes, they are willing to do that. So that's something held very sacred by Lions. We demand a strict code of ethics. Now I've got another question for you. You know how uh, every one of us in our lives uh, comes to, uh, lives through life-altering experiences? Well, we all do this. When we graduate from high school, graduate from college, when we get married, events that change our life. And how about this one? The birth of your first child. Well, the birth of any child is kind of a life-altering experience, but that first one, wow, does that change your life. Well, Lions International went through a life-altering experience. You will notice that if, if I were to ask almost anybody in this room, what's their first impression of lions? What do, what do you know about lions? Almost everybody's going to say, oh, these are, these are people that do stuff for blind people. I haven't said the word blind yet, have I? Except in the sentence I just finished. There's nothing in our Constitution 
Nothing in our bylaws. Melvin Jones didn't say anything about blind people. He just said he wants us to help needy. Well, at our international convention, and I believe the year was 1932. 25. Pardon me? 25. 25? Don't say the word. Don't say the word. Don't say the word. 25, thank you, because I could not find the date. Okay, 1925. A woman was invited to come and address the International Association of Lions Clubs. That woman was blind, deaf, and at least partially mute. At 18 months, she got a sickness that almost killed her, and it left her blind and deaf. And of course, if you're blind and deaf from 18 months on, how do you learn to speak? rather hard to learn words and vocabulary when you can't hear it. Uh, yet this woman grew, grew up to be a very vibrant and a very productive person. Most of us, if you or I were afflicted as she was, most of us would be sitting around like vegetables. Not this woman. In fact, I wouldn't be afraid to bet that she invited herself <laughs> to that international convention. Now, Joe, nobody heard what you said. Who am I talking about? <laughs> Helen Keller. Yes. <coughs> Helen Keller came and, I don't know, I'm putting quotation marks, addressed, addressed the Lions Convention, International Convention, and what she said to us was, you guys, after those days we were just guys, you guys say that your objective in life is to help your fellow man. I can give you a few million who could use your help. She dropped the gauntlet at our feet. She challenged us to, be some, to become crusaders to help blind people. She challenged us to become knights of the blind. And what did we do? Well, we picked up the gauntlet and we went on picked up the gauntlet and we accepted it and from that day forward the life of every single lion in the world was changed because we do a lot for other people but we do an awful lot of things for blind people. Let me talk a little bit about the mechanism that we used to do this. There was a foundation set up. Lions International, Lions Clubs International Foundation. And you know how foundations work. They get money, they get money from various sources. They got a board of directors or some kind of a board that runs the foundation. And they, they welcome requests for grants, for projects. And this board decides what projects they're going to fund and which ones they aren't. And that's what this foundation does. This is an international foundation, Lions Clubs from all over the world put money, give money to this foundation, and the foundation, well, let's read the mission statement. To support the efforts of Lions Clubs around the world in serving their local communities and the world community through humanitarian service, major disaster relief, and vocational assistance programs. If you look at, here's some ideas of things that Lions, that LCIF funded last year. Last year alone, we gave, I think, uh, it was pushing $50 million were given out in grants to support projects. Uh, in developing countries, uh, the projects involved uh, bringing cataract surgery to those who needed it to about 3 million people who needed cataract surgery and couldn't afford to get it. Um, it, it brought medication to eliminate the ravages of trachoma and river blindness. I'll talk a little bit about trachoma later. River blindness is something that, uh, that, I, that I kind of personally ran into recently. My youngest son took an expedition into southern Africa about two years ago. And one of the first things he was told was, be careful about river blindness. As you might suspect, river blindness has something to do with polluted water. And indeed it does. It's a bacterium that spread through the use of polluted water and many, many, many people in Southern Africa swim, drink, wash their clothes in polluted river water. The way it works is 
River blindness infects the eyes, it's a bacterium. And one infection doesn't do much, but they get repeated and repeated and repeated infections. It causes the eyelid to become so hard that as you blink your eye, you're scratching and scratching away at the cornea until you scratch it so badly that you're blind. The solution, of course, is, and medications do exist, to cure that river blindness when you get it. But the problem is getting it to the people who need it. And that's what one of our major, our major, major projects is with the Alliance Club. Using our money, our international money, to, to support putting together teams, teams of doctors, teams of medical people, who will go, who will take the medication to the people who need this to prevent, to prevent blindness. All they need is some eye drops. But if they're way out in the bush, how do they get them? Well, we have to try to get it to them. Worldwide, you can see up there, worldwide eye examinations and glasses for athletes for Special Olympic Games. The uh, Special Olympic Games that take place all around the world, we try to be there. We try to examine the, uh, the athletes, and if they need glasses, we get them glasses. Uh, we have a very special partnership with Habitat for Humanity. You know what that is. We have a very special partnership with Lens Crafters. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute and health examination. We like to examine people, people's eyes, but very often when we can get people together to examine their eyes, we throw in a bunch of other examinations too while we're at it. We give them a, a health screening. And of course down at the bottom, disaster relief. By disaster relief we're talking about you know, floods, earthquakes, eruptions, uh, major, major things that happen where, where, where huge amounts of money are needed. This is just a quick little article. Don't try to read the whole article. What it says up there is that the Acapulco Lions Club down in Mexico got together with the uh, downtown Memphis, Tennessee Lions Club, and they put together a multi-year project to eradicate cataracts in the state of Guerra in Mexico. They've given themselves several years, to think 10 years. They've given themselves 10 years to do this. And during those 10 years, they expect that they will that they will give uh, supply cataract operations for about 50,000 people during those 10 years. Uh, I don't know whether you realize it or not, but in the tropical countries where the sun is very very bright, cataracts are a lot bigger problem than they are for us. Lots of people in those countries that get have problem with cataracts. I close with a moment. I talk a little bit about trachoma. Trachoma is the disease that affects people just like river blindness does. Repeated, multiple, repeated infections ended up just end up just destroying the eye. One infection is no big deal, but when it goes over and over and over, trachoma is spread by flies. And in the developing countries, well, don't you love those pictures you see on television when they show you the picture of a little kid and mother's holding the kid and a fly is walking across the kid's eye and she cringe? Well, those flies bring trachoma. And repeated trachoma infections destroy eyesight. You always associate Lions Club with recycling of eyeglasses. During the year 2001 alone, we collected over 5 million eyeglasses. We cleaned them, we prepared them, we classified them, and we made them available to people who went out and gave them to people who needed them who needed eyeglasses. And lest you think we do this only out in developing countries or something like that, this article right up here is about, takes place in Florida. It deals with migrant farm workers in Florida. It's also done out in California. Lions have projects where when we can, we get to these migrant farm workers, we give them eye examinations, and if at all possible, we use these recycled eyeglasses to give them a set of eyeglasses so they can so they can see and they can read. Lions and lens crafters. This is something that our club uses all the time. The lions part of this is we find people who need eyeglasses but don't have the financial wherewithal to get them. We get those people an eye exam to document what they need, and we refer them to lens crafters, and the club pays a nominal fee. Lens crafters, on their part, makes an appropriate pair of glasses, 
and fits them to this person. When that person goes to lens crafters, they're treated like any other customer of lens crafters. They are taken in there, they let them pick out their glasses, the glasses are made for them, fitted for them, guaranteed for them, just like lens crafters does if you were in there paying your, and paying your hundreds of dollars for a set of eyeglasses. Um, and these people get a nice brand new set of eyeglasses custom made for themselves. Um, by the way, down at the little note at the bottom saying, Lens Crafters also supplies a lot of the help we need to classify these used eyeglasses that are given to us. You also have got to, uh, I'm sure you would associate with lions, the whole business of guide dogs. Well, they've come by many names, guide dogs, seeing eye dogs, leader dogs. Right here in Connecticut, we have a, a group called Fidelco, which breeds and raises seeing eye dogs. These dogs are specially bred. They're raised by volunteer families until they're about two years old. They go through a two-year training program. And notice the first word in number four. They are given. <coughs> given to a qualified blind person. Steps number one, two, and three cost about $20,000. And Lions Clubs are always looking for ways that we can help to finance that process, to finance guide dogs, the preparation of guide dogs to be used. Uh, step number four, we're told uh, a, a guide dog usually lasts about 10 years when we give it to somebody. We give them, uh, help them. Uh, and these guide dogs become just, just invaluable for those people. Here's another little article just to show you how things can grow. Back in 1977, one lion in one lion's club out in California decided to put together a nice little day for special children. Uh, by 1983, that had grown to an event with service 1,200 children. Over 400 lions took place in the event. Those 400 lions came from about 40 different lions clubs. So in a few years, it went from one guy trying to do something for special children to a huge event. And the event takes place annually. There's a, uh, there's a research, uh, LCO, this is Lions Club International Fund. There's a Connecticut branch of this Lions Club International Fund. fund. Uh, we've, we've, we've raised millions of dollars back in the year, in last year, the year 2000, 2001. Uh, we made grants totaling all, well, 390 to $79,000. A lion's share of that money went to fund macular degeneration research down at Yale and at the Yukon Medical Center. There's a camp here in Connecticut called Camp Hemlock, which is owned by Easter Seals. Lions Club takes great pride in giving them as much support as we possibly can. There's a Connecticut Lions Eye Research Foundation, uh, which zeroes in on helping, uh, you know, type 1 diabetes very often has as a consequence the eventual loss of your sight. Um, and this foundation zeroes in on things that can be done uh, screening with, with block equipment, put it in community hospitals, so people with type 1 diabetes will even keep, keep close tabs on whether it is affecting their eyes or not. Right now, we've got a half a million dollar project raising money to study macular degeneration down at Yale, and the word we're getting is that that project is, is running way ahead of schedule. We're going to have the half a million dollars much sooner than we thought. Down at Yale, by the way, there's a department there called the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. Yale had a building that became free a few years ago called the Boardman Building, but the building had been used by somebody else and their Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences was spread all over the campus. Um, Lions Clubs came in and, and put up the money to refit the building so that that department could move into the building and have a home and do their research. And, uh, anybody ever heard of Timolol, T-I-M-O-L-L-L? -L -L? It is the most common used pharmaceutical in the world today to fight glaucoma, to treat glaucoma. Guess what? That was developed right here in New Haven. It was found right there in the Boardman building. And every lion takes great pride in that. Timolol, Tim by the way, started off just as an extract from the common polyus plant. But 
They went through the whole process of refining it, synthesizing it, getting it approved by the FDA. Some of all issues all over the world today for, for people who have problems with glaucoma. Uh, let me say a couple words about Lioness Clubs. It was started as kind of a women's auxiliary to Lions Clubs. 1993, the International Convention passed a resolution that invited women into full and equal membership in Lions Clubs. Uh, I carefully worded the next two sentences. It discouraged, but did not eliminate Lioness Clubs. It encouraged, but did not force existing Lions Club to accept women members. Anybody want to guess what happened? I could call on about 10 of you and say, yes, everyone, because everything happened. All hell broke loose. <laughs> and Lions Clubs. Let me give you some quick ideas right here. And the clubs, every one of these examples I'm going to give you happened right here within a few miles of where we are. Immediately, Women became an integral part of the Lions Club. They were invited into members. Some clubs invited them right in. They became an integral part of the club immediately. Some clubs swore that they would never admit a woman into their sacred club. And there are clubs today that still are holding out on that. Other clubs in other towns, the Lions and the Lioness Clubs merged and became a single club. In other towns, the Lions and Lioness, Lioness Clubs did not merge, but cooperate with each other and work together. Uh, in fact, there's a club right down in the valley here, very closely, that still has its Lions Club and its Lioness Clubs. And in fact, two years ago, the president of the Lions Club and the president of the Lioness Clubs were husband and wife. <laughs> and uh, from at least all other certain other this could, everything seems to be going fine. But that's the way they decided to do this. Uh, and then I can also tell you, unfortunately, that here, right here in Connecticut, there are clubs who fought so bitterly over this that the clubs actually split in two and split into two separate clubs, one of which admits women and the other of which will never admit a woman. They actually they, they tore the club in half. And that's happened at clubs here. So, uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you what we've done here in Bethany. Guy Yale's going to talk about Bethany. But let me see uh, just a couple more uh, about Leo's Clubs. The Leo's Clubs were started as an organization to prepare young men and, since the passing of the enabling resolution, young women for full and equal membership when they grow up into a Lions Club. Uh, Lions Day at the United Nations, I just want to tell you, uh, at the United Nations, Lions International holds a seat on almost every single committee there that has to do with humanitarian efforts around the world. Uh, people, uh, Lions visit each other when we're even in foreign countries, we visit each other. Uh, we're always welcome and other people's members. Uh, we had a Japanese businessman come through one day and stop in at one of our club meetings and he left a banner for us. Uh, by the way, our international convention coming up in uh, July is going to be in Osaka, Japan this year. Uh, let me give a quick summary. So what do we do here? Lions Club's activities fall into three broad categories. Support for vision-related projects, research, examinations, treatment of, of eye problems, uh, a million different forms of community service projects, and uh, Fundraising activities, oh gee, uh, we love to get, when our clubs get together, we always talk about it, and what do you do to raise money? And we, some clubs have come up with those on land, I've land these things you've never heard of. I'd love to tell you about some of them, but we got other things to do. <laughs> so, uh, let me turn, I'd like to turn the, uh, the lectern over now to Lion Guy Yale, who is going to talk to you specifically about the first 50 years of our Lions Club here in town. Guy. Well, I want to thank you, uh, I want to thank you, Don. You reminded me of five things I've already admitted, but uh, I'll try to do my best here. A uh, couple things here. Uh, I've been asked to uh, try to encapsulate um, 50 years of Lionism in Bethany 
Uh, it's a distinct honor. I hope uh, I can do justice to the many good works that have been done in Bethany by the Lions. Um, and uh, so to start things off here, let me just, uh, I suppose you're wondering, like I've been for the last three weeks when I've been working on this, why me? Um, I guess a couple of reasons. I've been the Lions Club historian for about 10 years, and somebody said, when are you going to do some history? So I guess tonight's the night I'm on stage. And the second thing which uh, really comes into play here is that um, all Lions are sponsored one way or another um, by members, and uh, I just happen to be sponsored by probably the most influential member in the formation of the Bethany Lions Club, Mr. Frank Hoff, who was the very first president of the Bethany Lions Club, a very generous man, and, um, and uh, he sponsored me into the Lions Club. He was very influential in the founding of the club because when we were preparing for the club, uh, one of the things we did was, or at least I personally did, was I phoned many of the, um, or some of the original club members. We're now talking about, and I'd like you to now focus back, it's March 6th, 1952, 50 years ago. Um, but at any rate, we um, talked to many of the family members of some of the original club members. I personally talked to a special club member I'm going to talk about later. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you that I talked to uh, the wives of some of the deceased members. And our history here tonight is based on some documents we have, many, many photographs that we have, as you're going to see. So let's get started here, if I can make this thing operate properly. And here we go. Uh, Oh, we've got some lions here. Lions and lions. Uh, this is kind of representative of our annual picture. So we've taken the Memorial Day Parade. We've been very fortunate over the years to have a very dynamic photographer, uh, Michael Bryan, who's uh, got some great photos that he's uh, given the Lions Club. Now, I want to go to some of, uh, let's talk about the focus going back to March 6, 1952. This is a list of the very first group of charter members, or 19 charter members of the club. Uh, I can't, I guess we can't really go through all the names, but there are, uh, Walter Bolesky is one of the names, he's, I mentioned him because he's still, a, he's still living in town. He was the second president of the Bethany Alliance Club. There's Mr. Don Disbro who has, believe it or not, been a member of the Bethany Lions Club for over 50, for the whole 50-year period. Uh, I had a chance to talk to Don, and one of the things he impressed on me was, geez, he says, when we first started, there weren't many of us. He said, most meetings, there were just a handful of people that showed up. But we owe a great debt to uh, some of these founding members. Uh, there are many others here. I think uh, Ted Gurley is one of them, one of the old neighbor of ours. Uh, there is, of course, Frank Bob. There's uh, Ralph Downs, who was a selectman at the time. Many other uh, well-known families around town here. I'm sure that when you glance through the membership uh, list there, you will see many people you recognize. Now, uh, this is, a, uh, I guess, an international forum that makes us official. Uh, you might ask, how did the Lions Club get started here in Bethany? Well, uh, in talking with Mir uh, Marie Surprise, uh, who is the uh, widow of Earl Surprise, who's one of the really active members of the Bethany Lions Club, and the um, an original member, she told me that uh, one of the big influences in getting the club started here in town was Carl Hoff, who was a member of the uh, Lions Club in Woodbridge, and his brother Frank, who was the first president here, he kind of excited Frank about starting the club here in Bethany. And I think that's probably uh, the most influential spark that got us going here. Now you might wonder, um, you might wonder how many members we have now. Well, we have 73 members now, uh, active members. 
Uh, and throughout this presentation, I'm going to try to relate where we're at now, where we've been, and try to give you a feel for some of the activities, some of the great uh, characters we've had in the Alliance Club, some of the things we've done to try to serve the town of Bethany, and really some of the fun things we've done over the years here in uh, the Bethany Lions Club. Uh, this, is a, this is a recapitulation, but I guess what it does is it gives us the charter date, uh, which is March 6, 1952. Now, two days, two days ago, which was March 6, 2002, two greatly significant things happened to the Bethany Alliance Club. The first you're aware of, we celebrated our 50th anniversary. But what you might not be aware of, and possibly it's more important for the future of uh, the Lions here in Bethany than anything we've done, is that the Bethany Lions Club also chartered officially at Amity Junior High School Leo's Club. And so now we have, uh, and it's under the great, incredible dedication of George McDonald, and Larry Perry also was a tremendous help on this, but George has been pushing for this for about five years. So now we have an official Leo's Club at the junior high, and they're kind of like a junior Lions Club, and I think this thing is going to work out great. Now, uh, I'm kind of talking faster, I know, but what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to focus back to think about what Bethany was like in 1952 on March 6th. As a matter of fact, um, the Lions Club met in an executive session and they have agreed to give a free drink at the end of this, uh, at the end of this uh, presentation to anybody who can name me on March 6, 1952, the President and Vice President of the United States, the Governor of Connecticut, and the first selectman of Bethany. Now, I'm going to give you about 15 minutes to think about that, but uh, I hope we got enough clues back there for everybody. But at any rate, you kind of got to think back because at the time, 1952, we're talking about a town whose population, according to the Connecticut State Register, was 1,318 people. We're talking about a town whose principal industry, according to the Connecticut Register, excuse me, was agriculture. So we're talking about a small town. We're talking about a small town in 1952. Now while you're thinking about that, um, what we did was we went through the, uh, fortunately the Amity Star was published from 1950 to 1953. So uh, several of us went over to the Historic Society and we spent a night going through old Amity Star uh, publications and the very first one we found here was March 8, 1952, and this really is the only record we can find, that really a uh, written record here in town, for the first meeting of the Bethany Lions Club where they talk about the officers. Now, uh, is Russ here? Yes. Russ Von Baron. Well, I'll go back to that. Now, when we were uh, looking here, uh, we were doing this historical analysis of the uh, Bethany uh, of the Amity Star, you know, we were saying, gee, 50 years, it's not really history. Uh, it's so recent, we can remember this. Uh, I hate to say it, I can certainly remember 50 years ago. But at any rate, when we came across this in the Amity Star, we knew we were really doing with history because this is Russ and his wife's wedding anniversary. I won't dwell on it, but at any rate, we knew we were doing some history. <laughs> so anyway, I guess we should give them a, a hand here because uh, we're talking about 50 years ago. <laughs> By the way, Bob Fripp made me put this on. <laughs> uh, now, going on here, uh, let me go through some of these. Oh, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? We'll never get done with this. Uh, here are some of that. This is one of the first meetings. Now you notice it was at the Whittemore Restaurant in Seymour, June 16th. We did a little, uh, we did a little survey. In the early, uh, first few meetings, they met over at the Whittemore Restaurant. Somebody told me that that's really the Whittemore Tavern. But at any rate, over the years, the club has met at uh, Simpson's Speak Mountain Club. We've met at the Hinman Fire Station. 
We've met at the Duke Drop-In. We've actually met at Teddy B's a few nights. We've met, uh, I was a member of the club at the time, but at uh, one time, the Bethany Alliance Club actually met in a residence here in town, the Humphrey residence on uh, Amity Road. She apparently was a caterer, and uh, they would meet there and have catered meals and that type of thing. We have been fortunate over the years when we met the uh, Inman Fire Station for a long period of time. Uh, we had uh, some of the Congregational Church women serve meals, and uh, we've had uh, Facets Farm serve meals for a while at the present time. We're meeting over at Lakeview Lodge, and uh, we have caterers who are serving our meals there. As you know, Alliance Club, or you may not know, we traditionally have a meal in the evening. We meet every Tuesday, twice a week, twice a month. And we usually have a speaker, and we meet for dinner. At any rate, that's an encapsulation of where, kind of where we've been. Uh, this is another uh, uh, thing we took out of this 1952 article out of the Amity Star about uh, a, really a uh, kind of a organizational banquet it's going to be held at Donuts Town Co. on Post Road in Milford. Anybody know what that is now? That's the Dakota Restaurant. Right. All right, now uh, we go, uh, I'm going to go through this fairly quick. This is a Amity Star, again, an article about that first meeting. You'll note that we were presented the flag, flag by the Bethany BFW. I think we still have that flag here. Um, and uh, talks about the, the we're sponsored by the Woodbridge uh, Lions Club. Uh, continuing on here, oh, it's time now. Has everybody come up with who was the president and vice president of the United States? Who can give me that one? Okay, who was it? Any other guesses on the government? This won't help you. This won't help you. This is the election in 52, but it's later than March 6th. Now you'll notice here, the reason we put this on here, this is one of the most famous elections in Connecticut history when Prescott Bush, related to George, George W., his grandfather, ran against Abraham Rubicon. But at any rate, who was the governor in 52? John Lodge. And who was the town selectman here? Wallace, Wallace Saxon, we got him there. He's got a free drink. <laughs> All right, if you could guess the senators, you really are entitled to something, but I won't get into this. I guess uh, we'll go on here. Now, um, uh, this, it turns out, from the Bethany Star, we believe, was the very first fundraiser. You know, the Bethany Alliance Club, we raised money. We have very service projects, and it's always a chicken and egg thing. You got to raise some money to have the, you know, to do the service. This looks to be, from what we've investigated, to be our very first service project. It turned out to be a Christmas toy sale to be held in December 1952. This next uh, little article tells that it was held in Doolittle's garage. Anybody know where that is? That's the old garage. It's still in existence. The building is still over there. Um, Wesley was one of, was a neighbor at one time, but it's still there. It was. Uh, I guess he had an automobile sales place in there one time. Um, but at any rate, it was a toy sale to uh, raise money to give equipment. And if you look around the room here for this gymnasium. It was designed to raise money to buy equipment for the new gym, and this, according to what I've been told, was the new gym. So that was our first fundraiser. This is probably our most recent project to bring us up to date here. This is the gazebo outside here. This is the gazebo. Uh, this is the dedication of the gazebo. It was uh, really in 19... Um, just last year, 2001, some of our lions here, Sue Martins, the present chairman, the present president, and Craig Stahl, former president, 
Bob Kirsch, former Lions Club president here in Bethany. This is the dedication of the gazebo uh, out here, just outside the building here. That is our most recent project. Now you're probably saying, well, what have you done in the last 50 years between the toy sale and the gazebo? So let me see if I can scroll through here and kind of encapsulate what we've done. Uh, this is uh, 1986, uh, 1986 article uh, where Ray Perry uh, is talking about the ICL solicitation. It turns out that we have been soliciting through our solicitation letters for the ICL fund and various other Bethany projects since 1966. Um, here in the town, we've had great success. We thank the residents of Bethany for the great support we received of that solicitation over the years. Going forward here, oh, there's our auction. Uh, this is uh, one of the um, uh, posters for our auction. And this is our fourth in 1990, so that makes our first twin, 1987, right? Is that right? Let's see, third is 89, second 88, 87, okay, something like that. Uh, somebody told me we got one coming up, I think it's April 5th, am I right about that? So we'll put that ad in right now. We've been doing the auction ever since. Uh, it's been a great fundraiser for the Bethany Lions Club. We appreciate the tremendous support we've had for it. Here's some characters you may have uh, known before. Uh, this is about, I believe this is the 1987, the very first one we ever did. Uh, we've got Ed Rostowski, who's claimed to fame. Um, I'll talk about this later, but uh, Ed is just like George Bush. He's a father, son, president team. His father was the president of the Lions Club, uh, as well as Ed. We've got uh, a historical member of note there, Tyner, and uh, our longtime auctioneer, um, Mark Levine. Uh, continuing on here, this is an announcement that appeared in 1995 about some of the more, uh, some of our auction. Um, here are some pictures of one of our auctions. You can see in the foreground here, I think it's uh, Benny DeCenzo who is also a president of the club, and I think that's Bruce, another president of the club, and various members uh, bidding up these uh, fantastic gifts. There's Joel Nesson, former president of the club. There's Mark Levine. I don't know what they're auctioning off, but uh, you can bet it went for big bucks, whatever it was. Uh, there's somebody trying to... Uh, this actually is... Uh, a photo, you may not be aware of it, but uh, at one time uh, before we were totally ran out of, run out of this by the uh, Mashapequa Pequots, uh, Bethany Lions Club, the BAA, and the fire department used to run um, Las Vegas nights here in the town hall here. We ran that for many, many years. Uh, I think it was probably 8 to 10, I'm not sure how many, I think we kind of quit at about 1980. Those are some pictures of that fundraiser that were furnished to us. Um, health fair. We, at one time we, uh, we ran for about 10 years a health fair, one of the big, uh, big uh, activists in that health fair was Ben DeCenzo, uh, who was the president and he was, uh, did a lot of work for that. Um, we discontinued it because we found that people in Bethany were just too healthy and it uh, was no longer a service. Uh, here's some of our photos of the health fair. That's here in the gym here. Um, probably some people here you can recognize. Um, let me just see here. I can I can't recognize too many, but uh, I'll continue on here. Um, a couple of things here. This is a uh, this is a notice that appeared in 1996 about the health fair. So we were still running the health fair, and I can't remember the exact date. I don't have my notes here. I got I kind of got one thing in each hand, but I do have notes somewhere that would tell me that. 
Uh, but we did discontinue the health fair a few years ago, and it also talks about our Lions Club Parade. Now, another project we had, this is a 1986 project um, where uh, we cooperated in conjunction with the fire department. Uh, this was when we distributed the house numbers here in town. Uh, this is Bill Simon on the right, who was president at the time. Gordon Carrington, who was uh, both first selectman and a longtime Bethany Lions member. And um, by the way, according to my calculations, the first selectman of Bethany, this, at least to uh, Gordon Carrington and John Ford and now Craig Stahl, met in the Lions Club for at least well over 30 years. Uh, the first selectman of the town of Bethany has been a Lions Club member. We had a number of other very active people in uh, town affairs, uh, members of the Lions Club. Continuing on here, one of the things we do every year when, I guess, uh, things work out, because we do this every now and then, one year we split up and never got together again. At any rate, um, this is Christmas caroling. Caroling we do every year. Uh, in the last few years, uh, Larry Perry has actually you know, taken us around on the bus. We have a great time. Uh, we think the people enjoy it. Um, and this is a picture taken, I think, about 10 years ago. One of the individuals there is uh, George McDonald, one of our presidents, past presidents of the Lions Club. Um, that might be a real surprise there on the right. I'm not sure. I can't quite, uh, I think it is, actually. Um, George is first in on the uh, Continuing on here, uh, we do have over at the recycling center, we have an eyeglass collection. As Don said, this is one of the things I did manage to include in my speech here. As Don said, uh, the Lions are incredibly active in the eye vision area, in the uh, eye, eye care area. We have a, uh, this is Sue Martins, our present president, uh, showing everybody that this is with, over at the recycling center. We have a box if you care to put eyeglasses in the box. And we have uh, recycled them for a number of years, and I'm sure they've uh, found some great homes. Uh, by the way, uh, in 1993, we did uh, admit uh, uh, women to the Lions Club. We have a very active group of women, incredibly hard workers. And so the answer to Don's question is that's what we uh, have done here in the Bethany Lions Club. Uh, also, Lions over the years, we go to these conventions. Believe it or not, Lions have fun. And uh, this is one of the uh, Lions conventions. I think the board was a real surprise. Uh, one of the charter members, I think that might be, uh, uh, is that Ray Perry? I can't just quite, I just can't quite uh, get to, and I think Edgar Civitello, uh, who has passed away, but was very active for years, is in uh, the, the very back of that. Uh, oh, there's another one. This is our installation banquet, which sometimes gets out of hand because everybody is always uh, fighting to become officers of the uh, Lions Club. But uh, at any rate, we'll continue on here. This is one of the common things that uh, we do in the Lions Club. This is Arnie Carey, a past president, Bruce Hestock at one of our uh, meetings where we're inducting new members into the Lions Club. This was probably taken at Hinman, wasn't it? Oh, well, that's possible. That's possible. But we do serve. We do serve. All right, continuing here. One of the uh, projects we've had over the years, as I think people know, is we tried to pin down the actual dates of this, and we were not able to do it with precision, but we think it goes back certainly they told me to tell everybody for many years, but certainly it predates 1975. That I know. We've given away um, scholarships to Amity graduates. I picked out one of the uh, pictures that uh, we had in our files here because two of the individuals here who, who have been uh, very active in that 
uh, over the years are no longer with us, but they were very active in our uh, scholarship uh, selections and raising money and getting people excited about the Emmy scholarships with Joe Fair on the left and Dr. Plummer on the right here. Uh, these are three winners. I know the, uh, the individual is Jeremy uh, Pogas on the, uh, is one of the winners there. I don't know the other two, but this is a picture that must have been taken about, uh, well, let's see here, about 1989, somewhere in that period of time. Uh, as you know, uh, every year we give uh, scholarships. We've increased them from a hundred, couple for a hundred dollars. We now give five thousand dollars in scholarships to Emily graduates. We have four winners each year. One of the scholarships, uh, a two thousand dollars scholarship, is uh, given in memory of Joe Fair, who is incredibly active in this part of our um, club function. Continuing on here, this is just another. Uh, I guess you'd say uh, this is an 86 thing, um, 86 article we cut out of a paper about the uh, Lions Scholarship. Um, Bill Simon was president at the time. This is when we raised it to four scholarships, or at least we're giving four scholarships. Um, and uh, it talks about who the winners were at the time. Um, let me uh, continue on here. Uh, more, oh, there's George McDonald, and this is uh, one of our more recent ones. And this was the 2000 group of, uh, of scholarship winners. George McDonald is in the uh, middle there with the two winners on the right and the left. Um, Going back over the years, what have we done here in Bethany? Well, at one time we were active in the food drive. This is when uh, Ed Rostowski was president, I believe, and we were packing uh, food baskets. I think we did this around Thanksgiving and Christmas, and they were distributed to needy people. Uh, other people have stepped in with this project, so we no longer are involved in that. Um, this is Ed. Ed was a big spender when he was president, as you can see here. Um, he's handing out money right and left, and uh, the fellow on the left is an official from the Lions Club, international or state or region, I don't know which, who's more than happy to receive all this money, and Ed's actually happy to hand it out. And these would be for our Lions type things, our um, uh, I, I research, glaucoma research, uh, that type of thing. Uh, you can see another group, uh, Bill Simon, when he was president, uh, he was happy to uh, hand out some money also. Ben Desenzo is to his left. I think it's perhaps Marisa Klein. Yes. 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 Is that right? Uh, and uh, she's accepting a check for the Bethany Library bid for um, senior citizens. Uh, and then we have a Lion official. I think that's Evie Carrington accepting for the ambulance corps. Is that right? But anyway, that's typical of uh, what we do at the end of the year. We have supported our Bethany organizations over the years, including the fire department, the ambulance corps. We've been involved in the DARE program at the school. We've been involved in the essay contests for the youngsters uh, in the school, and numerous other projects, some of which uh, other people stepped into the breach, and so we went on to other things. As the timer is mentioned, um, we are, uh, this year we're going to be uh, contributing to the Historical uh, Society. We've been very active in contributing to the Bethany Library Association. Um, we have uh, contributed uh, the stove here, the, in the kitchen here. We uh, many projects around town over the years. Um, Continuing on here, oh, there's Timer. Uh, he's handing money out. Not as happy, I guess, as some of the others. Maybe he wanted it to go to the Historic Society. I don't know. But anyway, this is, a, this is one of our uh, local Lions uh, uh, fellows. They're probably money for the Lions Eye Research, which we also heavily support here. Uh, now, uh, 
what I tried to do here is encapsulate uh, what we do. We raise money. We have many, many service projects. Uh, this is the very first uh, year that uh, the Lance Club over the years has been involved in the Memorial Day Parade, but the very first year that the Lions picked up the Memorial Day Parade was 1972. And um, this is the very first uh, program for that event. Um, as you can see, it, it uh, honored the three gentlemen of the Bethany here who gave their lives in World War II. Um, we have been um, we've been very. Uh, this is the other part to this uh, this uh, announce this uh, program. You can see that uh, uh, over the years it's been so, uh, consistent uh, uh, type pro uh, consistent type uh, uh, event for the Lions Club. So since 1972, we have organized that is the Bethany Lions Club with the help of many townspeople who uh, have been involved in it. Uh, if this uh, this one was, uh, we actually had a, we had a grand marshal this year who was uh, a woman, Edna Delano, who was chosen for her service in World War I. Um, continuing here, this is another program that we were able to, uh, we were able to uh, locate. Uh, I think this came actually through the Historic Society. Okay. Which way are we going now? <laughs> I'm not making much progress, that's for sure. All right, now, um, one of the uh, things that trademarks the Lions Club is our Lions and uh, one of the great characters in the Lions Club over the years because he contributed such a great amount to our organization was Hans Dutzman. He is the creator of the Lions. We still have them. Uh, and uh, I guess in about two months we're going to parade them out again. Um, uh, at any rate, uh, he's proudly standing here with a couple of the Lions, I guess three of them. Um, this is... Uh, Hans again and some of the lions. You notice that that's 33 years of community service. I'll let you figure out what year that was taken. There's actually a Rolls Royce in the background of that in there. Is that right? Looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a Cadillac? I don't know. I know there are lions in that picture, but uh, can, and here's another picture. People, oh, you know, every year we Michael Bryan was very instrumental in taking uh, many of these uh, pictures over the years. But every year we get a group picture. It's one of the last things we do in the Lions Club. We always have great weather, as you can see. <laughs> great weather. Again, yeah, we always have, uh, I, the organizers of this club always have this tremendous, uh, I guess you would say, strategy uh, every year for the Memorial Day Parade, the question is always, do we want a bigger parade or do we want more spectators? Because we know the bigger the parade, the fewer the spectators and vice versa. But at any rate, uh, this is uh, some of the proud uh, Bethany uh, members. I think that might be, is that the junior high band? I can't quite see. Might be the elementary school band, I'm not sure. Here's, uh, is that John Bruce? I'm not sure. Is that John? Uh, some of our uh, World War II vets, this is a very recent photograph showing, uh, I guess, uh, and here's somebody who's, I guess he's the almost vice president. He came all the way to Bethany one year, took time out from the campaign, and uh, marched uh, down the uh, parade. I don't, I'm not sure what year this was taken. Um, yeah, you know, uh, here are a couple of proud, uh, uh, proud, again, we always have great weather, but here are a couple of proud lions. Every year we buy flags for the parade, and we also, uh, over the years, uh, going back to many, many years, uh, since we uh, started uh, organizing the parade in 1972, we bought flags that are placed 
at all the veterans' graves here in the town of Bethany. Uh, not only do we hand out the hand out flags during the Memorial Day parade, but if you visit these gorgeous graves uh, around the cemeteries here in Bethany, and it's one of the things that I've done several times over the years, you will see these flags uh, placed at uh, the veterans' graves, and the Bethany Lions Club is the one who's uh, responsible for the purchase of the flags. And I guess we've got them in for this year already. So um, here's a, another uh, one of the uh, parades. Now, again, as you know, uh, the conclusion of our parade, we have this uh, replay at the uh, in honor of our veterans here in town. This is a picture taken. This is Gordon Carrington, and I, we haven't been able to identify the gentleman on the left. Um, uh, one of the things I want you to take a look at is the memorial there, because when we go to this next picture, this is one. This is no longer in place here in Bethany. It's out outside the town hall here. Um, this is Gene Luciani, one of our former presidents at one of our Memorial Day uh, programs. He's also been high, uh, actively involved in some of our Memorial Day parade activities. Is that Dick Schoen or what? I'm not sure. I can't quite tell. But at any rate, uh, here is Memorial Day Parade with our community school band, which is always the featured performer. And I want you to take a look, because this is the new monument. This is uh, Mr. Bolesky and Mr. Hoppy. Um, uh, this is, uh, is, is that John Ford? Who's the one on the left there? Is that John? It might be John Ford, I'm not sure. This is the laying of the wreath that we do every year, but if you see that monument there, the Lions Club uh, helps uh, to um, the Lions Club helped to um, finance the building of that new monument to the veterans here in town. Um, I'll give you a better shot at it here. Uh, this is um, this is a kind of a what it looks like. It's in memory of the, the veterans here in town. A very elegant uh, monument, if I do say so. And I guess this, in some respects, is what it's all about. As far as the Memorial Day Parade goes, a very elegant picture that was taken. Um, and I've got, uh, I guess I have one last uh, slide here. It's hard to believe, but I guess I've got to say goodbye now. Uh, before I do, um, uh, the, the last thing we do every year um, is uh, the horse show. And so uh, I'm going to turn this over to a long time uh, co-chairman of the horse show um, who's going to give us a lowdown on the horse show. But anyway, that's roughly 50 years minus the horse show. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. That was a great, a nice job. Um, last but not least, uh, I, I want to do my best to try to describe uh, uh, the history of um, of our horse show. Um, the, uh, the Bethany Lions horse show is uh, has probably been our longest standing fundraiser, probably uh, our biggest fundraiser over the years. Um, we uh, we started uh, our, our horse show in 1971. It's kind of a natural, uh, I think, fundraiser and activity for the Bethany Lions. Uh, it's been a good way to meld the Lionism and, and our community for a couple reasons, I think. Uh, the the horse show, I think, reflects the, uh, the rural character of Bethany. Uh, you know, we, uh, at one time it was, it was uh, mentioned that uh, there were actually more, more horses than people in Bethany. I don't think that stands at this point, but uh, someone once said that uh, if you live in Bethany, uh, and don't have a horse in your backyard, you probably can smell one. <laughs> the breeze is, is just right anyway. Uh, a lot of horses in town. Um, second of all, it, it really involves a community in a lot of ways. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have uh, 
very generous people in town help us sponsor this horse show uh, over the years. Uh, and we also have a lot of people that show up at our horse show. All the nice folks uh, uh, enjoy a, a nice Sunday uh, in June. And our spectators at our horse show will, will provide a few dollars to, to get on the show grounds, which really helps us a great deal. And we appreciate that. But also, uh, a lot of participants, a lot of people who uh, are in town uh, uh, reflect the variety of different sectors of the horse community. Um, also, I think that, thirdly, it kind of reflects the personality of the people in Bethany. Uh, a lot of people like to, you know, we're here because we like the outdoors, and the horse show is an outdoor kind of activity. Um, a lot of us like to, to work real hard uh, at what we do, and that's what we do at our horse show. It's just, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of us lions to, to put this horse show on. And I kind of like the horse show for that reason, because it, it really, uh, really helps us, and I've used this many times in inducting people into that, into the club, but it helps us um, uh, build our bonds of, of, of fellowship, I think, uh, and, and it really has made the Bethany Lions Club a very, very strong club. Uh, I think if you ask anybody uh, in the state or the district uh, about the Bethany Lions, they're going to tell you that we're a real strong, very active uh, organization, and I think it's because we, we like to work hard, we like to work together, and I think the Horse Show provides us with that. Uh, uh, but, you know, that, it, it really gives us that, that uh, opportunity. And it's drawn uh, participants and spectators and officials from all over the Northeast. And I really think it's helped put Bethany on the map, um, particularly in the last, the last 30 years. Our first show was in 1971. Uh, we don't have any slides of that. Um, it was uh, mentioned to me by this gentleman here, who actually happens to be my sponsor. Uh, we all have our sponsors. Uh, Mac was very beneficial. Uh, it you know, had a lot to do with getting me into, into the Lions Club, probably so that I could participate in the horse show. Uh, I think that that was probably the underlying reason. But um, he mentioned that that first year, he and several of the Islamic cronies were, uh, were talking to the gentleman in the tech shop across the street, which, uh, uh, the owner of which I just, I don't know the name of. Someone's nicknamed him Dusty Rhodes. Uh, that's as close as I can get. If anybody knows who that gentleman was, uh, uh, let me know, because I'd, like I'd like to mention his name. But he was kind of uh, uh, our coordinator, along with the Lions, because I don't think too many of us Lions at that time, uh, really had any ideas to how to organize a horse show, so he helped us out. Uh, we started with a local show and involved members of the local community, um, and it's grown over the years. But in that initial year, we, we put up some snow fencing, some rope fencing, we didn't have the permanent rings up there. Uh, Tom Dowling from across the street uh, at the, uh, the local mini mart if you will, uh, help us with our food concession. He was a member of the club. Uh, Marie and Earl Surprise uh, hosted the out-of-town judges. Uh, you know, for dinner, the little restaurants, uh, I guess, in town that could support that. <clears throat> it was not really as professionally run at that time uh, as now, but uh, uh, they had a great time. So I guess we decided to keep going. So here we are in 1972. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the Lions Club was, uh, and its members were really getting into it in 1972. Um, there is probably one of our most photogenic lions. Uh, I think you probably all uh, recognize Boyd Johnson. Um, he, uh, he helps us with our, our sound system every year. Uh, a lot of you probably, if you're anywhere near the airport at all, or if the wind's just right, you probably hear us on a Sunday, early Sunday morning, uh, blasting you out of bed. It gets turned up too high. Um, this uh, reflects 
our, our real dedication to this horse show thing, and we've decided that we're going to put up some uh, uh, permanent horse rings at, uh, uh, at the airport. And uh, here we are using some of the latest technology. <laughs> uh, trying to get those holes done. And there we are. Bob Ritten said, gee, that looks like a bunch of, uh, bunch of state workers. <laughs> you know, one guy working and five guys standing around. <laughs> Actually, um, I was part of putting up the, uh, along with many, many of those lines, we're part of putting up the, uh, the new rings that are up there now. I think that's about the third set. And uh, we didn't stand around very long. We, we, we were really quite a push to get those things up. It took a lot of us and a lot of hard work. But uh, we wanted to get something that, uh, that really is permanent and looks pretty decent. And there's a group of us. And unfortunately, that's it's not a real good uh, focus on that. We didn't really get it focused. I'm not sure if I could even recognize any of those. I'm sure Max there and probably not Susan. And, uh, anyway. Uh, and there are the three amigos. I think probably you've seen each of them in, uh, in, in some of the, the other photographs uh, that the guy was talking about. There's Earl Surprise. There's my sponsor, Mac. And, uh, and, uh, Superintendent of the schools, Pete Plummer. This uh, this is a photograph that shows uh, I think though that first horse ring is as it was put up. I think that's the south ring. Uh, that was probably quite a while ago. I'm not sure exactly what year that was. We're coming back probably before I was uh, involved. I started probably 1977. There's an old announcer stand. Uh, Certainly, you all recognize that we've got a, a permanent building up there now, and I'd like to, to recognize uh, the Horse Council for, for doing that. Uh, Larry Caron, uh, or at least was uh, involved in putting up the, uh, the original permanent one. It really wasn't as permanent as we thought. <laughs> um, we do have a permanent one now. Uh, Arnie Noblestein uh, in the, the Horse Council, and a lot of lines, and a lot of other horse people, a lot of people in the horse community. Um, it's a concrete structure, believe it or not. And hopefully it's going to stay there for a while. There's our uh, photogenic line again. Um, and you, you can see in the background we've got this scruffy old trailer. Um, that's part of our permanent uh, uh, horse show storage for all our jumps and things. And it was donated by um, a local business would like to remain anonymous. I think you all know who it is. And we would uh, park the trailer over there every year and then it would be trucked up to the, to the, to the, uh, the airport. Uh, unfortunately, now it's just at the airport. <laughs> uh, not real attractive, but it does its job. And we're working on trying to straighten that out. There's uh, Wyatt Al Morrow from the, from the past. He's still around, he's still a member. Um, just looking fine. Uh, I put this in to, uh, you'll, you'll see the name of this young gentleman. That is not, as we all decided uh, at one of our meetings at the Historical Society, we looked at this and said, oh, that is not at the airport, but it does uh, reflect the name of Daniel Klotz. Uh, the Klotz name then uh, reflects back to the Malkins uh, at Windy Hill Farm. They were Early on, were very, you know, very much a part of our horse show. Helped us a great deal in trying to make it a more professional horse show and to draw people for further. Um, uh, Daniel is the son of Margie Klotz, who was uh, went on to uh, from Windy Hill Farm to her fame and fortune as a rider and a uh, uh, mother of Daniel Klotz, and she uh, she was very influential as a secretary for many years of our show. Um, that's an early uh, food concession. Uh, John Herb, I think, and you know, all these guys. I think there's, uh, there's one guy I'm sure you know, uh, President of the Historical Society. Uh, that's how much 
fun we have. We just have a good time doing this horse show. We really enjoy it every year. All Michaels. And there are all our Bethany spectators enjoying the, uh, the, the fine, uh, fine afternoon. We, uh, we also uh, order up a nice day every, every year. And uh, I'll, I'll get into that in a few minutes. It's part of our history. There's some, uh, some Boy Scouts who, for, for a number of years, would um, uh, camp out. We would set up all the jumps and, and they would camp out, try to, to uh, protect all our investments there uh, on a Saturday night. Bob Brandon said, you just got, you just got to put that slide in there. You can read that sign. It says, no horses. <laughs> what the hell do you have that? <laughs> the whole show. Here's a, <clears throat> what we call a drill sergeant, uh, Austin. He's a member of the club. Uh, he was very, uh, he was a, uh, very influential and uh, a very good lot of a lot of work in the horse show for many years, talking to women judges. Uh, there's Lion Jean. I think it must be uh, must be the uniform or something. But he's got uh, a number of uh, a number of ladies around in there. I think it's that lion uh, that lion vest. I don't know. He's having a good time. These uh, this this indicates not a very good picture, but it does show you. This is kind of the next generation of our horse rings up there. Um, I was not, I think it, this probably went, went up just before I became a member. I'm glad I didn't have to put these phone poles in. But a lot of guys did a lot of hard work to get those phone poles in so that nobody could take them down. Um, and they, they lasted for a long, long time. Um, I put this picture in because it shows a little pony by the name of uh, Mary Poppins. Uh, used to belong to a lady from Woodbridge called Bushy Doolittle. Uh, oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a picture of Bushy. Um, uh, Mary Poppins was uh, was one of these ponies that started at probably three or four years of age and took a, probably a dozen different riders, you know, young riders, probably uh, probably lived to be 30 years old and just campaigned all that time and took all these young riders to fame and fortune, uh, blue ribbons and all that sort of thing. And this little poem, I think Bushy was the, the first one to bring her into the show circuit. Um, that's supposedly a picture of Mary Poppins. I'm not sure it is. It looks like a different color horse. But this I put up because it shows that at one time we actually at the horse show drew 200 uh, horses. That's a lot of horses. That's a very big horse show. And we were drawing people from all over. We still do, but uh, there are a number of horse shows now. We don't quite get that many, many horses, but in our heyday, uh, the Bethany Horse Show was drawing tremendous numbers of people and, uh, and horses. There's a picture of yours truly. Thought I'd throw that in. Uh, that's back when I, uh, I used to uh, either own a horse or smell like one all the time, <laughs> because that's what I did for a living. Uh, I don't do that anymore, but uh, um, I was uh, brought into the club in 1977 and I was immediately you know, figured out that suddenly they just wanted me to be the veterinarian <laughs> on the grounds. Um, and I did that until I sold my horse practice in 1995 and then I couldn't do it anymore. But in 1982, they wanted me to be co-chairman of the horse show, so I've been doing that ever since and I'm still doing it and I enjoy it. A lot. Um, these next few slides just reflect the, the, the different sectors of the horse community in Bethany. Uh, Bethany just had, used to have horses of all shapes and sizes and varieties, and people who were interested in pursuing um, whatever you do with horses on all these different kinds of horses. Uh, certainly, the Western influence is, uh, is tremendous here in Bethany. Um, so we have a couple from some of the old shows of uh, these Western horses doing the variety of things. Certainly, I think probably the biggest segment uh, in the horse show uh, has been the English horse, uh, the English riding, and uh, that's a, a tremendous number of, of those individuals um, doing uh, English riding, 
jumping. So we have hunters and jumpers. And this reflects the, uh, the saddlebred community. Uh, they do things a little differently. Uh, Cynthia Jensen, uh, our Porsche secretary for, for quite a few years now, likes to call them the shaky tails. Uh, because they have these weird tails that take around. Uh, a lot of drivers, uh, a lot of people that drive ponies, uh, hacking ponies, drive all different variety of, uh, of horses. Um, another driver there. This is a, a breed class. Bethany has developed a lot of breeding going on. Of horses, I mean. Um, uh, a variety of different, uh, different breeds in town. And this is a huge class of uh, a compilation class. Uh, this is a cute picture. Of the, I, I just love this class. It's usually usually kind of at noon time when everybody's having lunch. They like to get these little tiny people and put them on these big horses and do a lead line class. And, uh, it's kind of a, kind of cute, kind of fun. Um, some of Bethany's finest. We need a, uh, an ambulance on the ground, so we uh, have to follow here. Uh, and here's Clark. I don't know if any of you recognize this gentleman. Uh, maybe not from that angle, but he's definitely a Chris. And Chris is a big name in uh, horseshoeing here in town. And for many years they were horseshoeing for us. We need a, we need a uh, a barrier on the grounds and then we have a horse show. This, uh, this is a picture of the horse show committee. Here's Hans, um, all by name Gary Gilbert. Um, and that year it was decided that, in 1980, that we wanted to have a two-day show. Now, a one-day show is expensive enough. Uh, Two-day show is twice as expensive. Uh, and, and meaning that we need judges, we need. Now uh, we're getting a little bit more riches here. We figure, well, uh, two hundred horses. Man. We're going to split it up. There's too many horses on that show ground, so we decided to do a two-day show. Um, well, uh, the weather wasn't really good that that year. And we probably didn't do very well, and I'm, I'll be leading up here in a few minutes. And, uh, just, just be nice. This is our 12th annual show. Um, since 1982, now, if anybody was in town or even in Connecticut in 1982, on June 6th, actually June 5th, actually probably June 4th and 5th and 6th, um, it decided to, uh, well, it was like the perfect storm. <laughs> if anybody's ever seen that, uh, that movie, we, we, We've had kind of a tough year. Uh, Friday night it started to, to rain. I don't think anybody realized it was going to rain for three days and rain 12 inches. But it, it just decided to coincide with the Bethany Lions Club for show. And we had a tough year. Uh, we, uh, it was kind of an interesting uh, a couple of stories. Uh, we had judges that came in. Um, this is a matter of fact, let me, I think I have a, hold on, sir. This is a news release that uh, Cynthia, Cynthia Jensen, she's been running that show for quite a few years now. I just thought I'd, uh, this is, this is a Bethany Lions Club Horse Show, the 12th annual Bethany Club Horse Show, now under new management, Cynthia was now doing the secretary work, uh, heading the list of American Horse Show Association judges, who have accepted the invitation to officiate will be Michael Page of Salem, North Salem, New York, who judged the medal in the play division at the National Horse Show in Madison Square Garden in November, and goes on to list a number of the other judges with the Arabians and the saddle horses. And Lucian Theriault of East Hampton will be the new course designer. We were just paying people left and right to help us run this horse show. And this was, of course, uh, 1982 and the perfect storm. And 
we ended up in some trouble. <laughs> because we ended up with nine horses, down from uh, 22, or 200. And we had judges that were staying down in Amity. They had to climb across the parkway on Sunday morning and get into a four-wheel drive and, uh, and be driven up to the showgrounds where there were four inches of rain in each of the rings and uh, nine horses. Um, it was quite a disaster. <laughs> um, but we all had a good time. Uh, I remember Russ and I, Russ and I in the, in the trailer, the trailer, the back of the trailer, trying to stay dry, uh, wondering what the heaven's saying we were doing here. Um, anyway, um, I remember also driving home, I'll never forget this, down Holy Road, and there was a big bank on the side of the road. Um, I think it must have been a, a eight or nine, maybe a ten inch in diameter uh, maple tree that kind of just slid down off the bank, right into the road, still standing straight up. It was quite a storm. It was, it was a we lost our swimming pool. Um, my point is, this was a, this was a cute little uh, uh, rendition of a, of, a, of, a, of a writer here that uh, Matt McDermott put together. And for years it was on our, our program. Um, you know, right on the front of the program, on all our posters. I've got a poster up here. Um, it always has said, uh, rain or shine. And so that year, we still have the show. But the next year, actually this is the 14th, but I think if we had the 13th, you'd see a little umbrella over this uh, this little gentleman here. And uh, for several years after, we got a little umbrella. Uh, the, uh, the club was beginning to get a little discouraged. And uh, so after the hosing of a couple of years of uh, heat, you know, heat stroke, uh, I think in 1983, uh, in all the rain, the club decided to maybe do something that was never ending. <laughs> so the history of the Bethany Lions Club Bar Show comes to a close uh, in 1984. And for 1985 and 1986, uh, we thought maybe we might be able to make a few more dollars doing this. Than busting our rear ends doing the horse show. Uh, so that's what we did. But in 1987, we were fortunate enough, uh, together with Cynthia, I was in, uh, uh, I was a Sleeping Giant Pony Club uh, parent at that time, and the Sleeping Giant Pony Club uh, was, was having a show probably three weeks before ours every year. It was a tiny show. Um, obviously, they were very interested in, in showing and riding their horses. So we decided that together with the Pony Club, the Lions Club, to sponsor a show, probably not have to work quite so hard, and uh, we did up some of the uh, some of the work. And that made it very palatable to our members, and so we decided to start it again, uh, running a horse show after two year hiatus. And we didn't have our, our little, uh, we didn't need anymore, we had an umbrella, so we started our, uh, our, our new Bethany horse show uh, along with the Sleeping Pony Club. And that first year, uh, there was a new phenomenon in the horse community, and that was miniature horses. Um, and since then, we have had the, the Miniature Horse Club Association help us to uh, to sponsor a little mini show, if you will, within our show of mini horses. I think one year we had close to 100 of these little guys. And they are actually um, a, a little horse and not ponies. You don't want to call them ponies in front of these owners after they spent $30,000 for a little mare. Not a pony, a miniature horse. Part of our uh, fundraising at the, uh, at the the show is um, a food concession. It has been for years and years. Um, we recently purchased food in the last, I don't know, eight or nine years, I guess, maybe ten years ago. Um, a, a trailer, we've uh, spent lots of money on that, trying to get it up the code, and we now use that. Uh, and there's a picture of it. Or 
with uh, with Ray's nice motorhome. Uh, Ray Martinos has done a lot of the work with the uh, with the food concession over the years, and uh, we kind of come into the modern times with uh, with our trailer. Uh, Billy's ice cream across the street. There's Bob Kelly. This is uh, best customer. Craig is a member of the club and very influential and uh, has been quite a sponsor of his business and, and with his time and effort in, uh, in the whole thing. Um, we also had some young entrepreneurs, uh, Lions uh, uh, Offspring, who are decided several years ago to kind of take their uh, take their uh, uh, great concession on the state on the, on the, on the road here and that's, uh, that's going to be a help. Um, you can see the new uh, the new horse uh, uh, of the new secretary stand or uh, announcer stand in the back right there. And the new horse trainers which we the Bethany Alliance, uh, along with the immense number of people in the horse community, uh, helped to put up very attractive rings, I think, and it's really, really made a difference in, uh, in uh, you know, the appearance of, uh, of the airport. This is, uh, you've seen a picture of Hans. Um, tonight I would like to, to dedicate my, my part of the uh, of the talk to, to Hans. Uh, Hans was a great lion. Uh, he worked hard, he was a detailed man, he was in the background. Um, but he, he just never wanted any claim or recognition. He just wanted the Bethany Lions to get the recognition. Um, he uh, obviously provide us, provided us with our Bethany Parade Lions. And he just wanted a well-run horse show. He would uh, he would take a, a week of his uh, two weeks vacation and actually sacrifice that week um, to do all that had to be done to get the to get the horse show um, ready and, and, and the show grounds ready and he just did a tremendous amount of uh, of work for us in that in that area he, he just really epitomized epitomized his lions the lions of today. I just, I just love one time to respect him very much. And I think that's a great picture of him. Um, and he just loved this whole show, just incredible. So I just wanted to dedicate uh, this part of the, of the talk to Hans. And I just want to thank you, Hans. And I want to thank you, uh, Bethany, on behalf of the club, um, for a great 50 years. Yeah, I think the uh, Lions really deserve a big hand because uh, they do a lot of things coming. While you've been watching this, I've been back here sampling all the goodies. And uh, if you're lucky, there's some back there that uh, you might enjoy. Good night. Thanks for coming.